Whenever I read about the lacrimal apparatus, it always had me in tears. But I won't let that happen to you. So join me as we unravel the mysteries of this eye-watering wonder in a way that will keep you intrigued and happy. Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to the anatomy of lacrimal apparatus. Lacrimal apparatus basically comprises of structures concerned with tear formation and tear transfer. In tear formation, we have the lacrimal gland and the accessory lacrimal glands. Whereas for tear transport, we have number of structures, namely we have the puncta, then the canaliculus, the common canaliculus, the lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct and the opening of the nasolacrimal duct guarded by the wall of Hasner. Now let us talk about each in detail one by one. First, we'll talk about the structures which form the tears and these are the lacrimal gland and the accessory lacrimal glands. The lacrimal gland is situated in the superior temporal quadrant of the orbit in a specialized fossa which is called the lacrimal fossa. The size of the lacrimal gland is that of an almond. The lacrimal gland is divided basically into two parts. It has a superior orbital part and an inferior palpebral part. The orbital part actually is in close relation to the orbit whereas the palpebral part is in close association with the eyelid. But the question is, how are they divided? So, if you consider this to be our bony orbit and on top of that we have the eyelids, the two muscles that you can see on top are actually the eponeurosis of the levator palpebrae superioris. The circle that you can see over here is actually the lacrimal gland. So, we we'll represent the lacrimal gland in red color. So, what happens is that as the levator palpebrae superioris comes from behind, it actually splits open the anterior half of the lacrimal gland and divides it into two parts, the upper orbital lobe and the lower palpebral lobe. However, as you can see over here, the posterior part of the lacrimal gland is actually intact and is not divided into the various lobes. So, here we have the upper orbital lobe, the inferior palpebral part, the green color one is actually the eponeurosis of the levator palpebrae superioris which is dividing the uh, lacrimal gland and here you can see the orbital septum in blue which tells you that the lacrimal gland is actually situated behind the orbital septum. So as you can see over here, so represent, this is representing the levator palpebrae superioris eponeurosis which is actually splitting just the anterior half of the lacrimal gland and the posterior half of the lacrimal gland is not divided into the superior and inferior lobes. This picture represents the same. You can have a look over here that this is the lacrimal, this is the levator eponeurosis and on top of that is our orbital lobe which is the larger lobe and a smaller lobe which is situated below the levator eponeurosis that is the palpebral lobe. Now, whenever the upper lid is actually averted, we'll see the lobe which is closer to the lid and that lobe is the palpebral part. So whenever you avert the upper lid, you will see a part of the gland. So you're actually looking at the palpebral part of the gland through the conjunctiva. Whenever there's enlargement of the lacrimal gland, because the lacrimal gland is situated in the superior temporal quadrant of the orbit, it will cause an inferior and a medial displacement of the eyeball, which is called dystopia. So as you can see over here, because the lacrimal gland is situated in the superior temporal quadrant, any swelling of the gland will actually push your eyeball inferiorly and slightly medially, and this is called inferomedial dystopia. Now let us come back to anatomy again. So, the, there are about 10 to 12 ducts of the lacrimal gland which open in the superior fornix and 1 to 2 ducts will open in the lateral part of the inferior fornix. One important point to remember is that all the ducts will finally pass through the palpebral lobe and then enter your fornix. So the ducts which are coming from the orbital lobe will also pass through the palpebral lobe and palpebral ducts are anyways coming from the palpebral lobe and finally they will drain into the superior fornix. So this brings us to a clinical point that whenever you excise the palpebral part alone, it actually amounts to excision of the entire gland as far as the secretory function of the gland is concerned and this happens because all the ducts are passing finely through the palpebral lobe. Therefore, whenever you want to take biopsy from the lacrimal gland, it is advisable that you take it from the orbital lobe. 
coming to the histology of the lacrimal gland. So lacrimal gland is basically a compound tubulo alveolar gland and it is structurally very similar to that of your parotid gland. So here you, what you'll see is these various lobules which are represented here in yellow color. These lobules are separated by connective tissue septum and these connective tissue septum consist of various blood vessels which are represented in red color. Now within these lobules you can see the circular structures which I've marked in green. Those are called the SNI and each SNI actually has variable amount of cells which are arranged in a circular fashion and they basically uh, form the secretory component of the gland and the secretion of the lacrimal gland as we know uh, is basically the serous secretion or watery secretion. Now what about the accessory lacrimal glands? So in my video on anatomy of conjunctiva, I talked in detail about the accessory lacrimal glands where we talked about we have something called the glands of cross which are located within the stroma of the conjunctival fornix okay so there are about 20 to 40 in the upper fornix and there are about six to eight glands which are located in the lower fornix similarly we talked about the glands of wolfring which are located at the upper border of the tarsal plate so this one which i've marked in blue color is your tarsal plate sitting just above your tarsal plate is the glands of of Wolfrey. They are much larger than the cross, however their numbers is smaller. So we have the glands of cross, glands of Wolfring. Apart from that, we have some very tiny rudimentary lacrimal glands which are located in the carinkle and plica semilunaris. Now important clinical point is that all of these together will contribute to your basal tear secretion. Okay, so although they form just 10% of the total lacrimal secretory mass, they actually together contribute to your basal tear secretion. So whenever you see this bulb in the slide, it means that I'm going to talk about a clinical point in that section. So basically your lacrimal gland produces the tears and drain it into the uh, superior fornix and finally it flows from the lateral to the medial conjunctiva and now it is going to enter your puncta and finally reach your nose. So now we are going to talk next about the structures which are involved in the tear transport. So first let us talk about the puncta. The punctum is located at the posterior edge of the lid margin that is at the junction of the pars ciliaris and pars lacrimalis. Now, in my video on the anatomy of the eyelid, I mentioned to you what is meant by the anterior edge and the posterior edge of the eyelid. And I also explained what is the pars ciliaris and the pars lacrimalis in the eyelid. So it's basically a junction, a point where the later fifth of the eyelid actually has lash, uh, lashes or cilia, whereas the medial part of the eyelid does not have any cilia. And at the junction of those two points, we have our punctums located. Now, each of these punctum actually sits on a lacrimal mound or an elevated structure and that elevated structure is called the puncta lacrimalis. Now, the puncta lacrimalis is basically a vascular. That means it is devoid of any blood vasculature and therefore it looks pale in appearance. Also, this increased paleness sometimes might actually point towards a possible stenosis. So, again, this is one important clinical point. Now, normally what happens is that our punctum, whether it is superior punctum or the inferior punctum, are normally present slightly posterior and in close approximation to the globe. And therefore, as you can see in this picture of a normal eye, it's very difficult to actually see those two puncta, right? So, the punctum can actually be inspected properly only by averting the medial aspect of the lids. The upper punctum over here, as you can see, by slight eversion of the upper eyelid, you can see it is situated about 6 millimeters from the inner canthus, whereas the lower punctum, which is situated here, again by slight eversion of the lower lid, is situated at a distance of about 6.5 millimeters from the inner canthus. And therefore, you can actually observe that the lower puncta is slightly lateral compared to the upper puncta. The upper punctum is actually located at about 6 millimeters, whereas the lower punctum is located at about 6.5 millimeters. So the location and the patency are very important factors whenever you study these punctums.
So the first one we have is the punctal stenosis. As you can see over here in this picture, it is very difficult to see that black dot and this increased amount of paleness. This actually tells you that the patency is lost and we're dealing with the case of punctal stenosis. What about this? Here you can see an eyelash coming and actually blocking that punctal uh, area. And this is called punctal blockage because of a lash. Similarly, sometimes what happens is that the location of the punctum gets displaced because of a large carinkle, as can be seen in this case. This large carinkle has actually displaced the lid forward and therefore the punctum has actually moved from its original location. Similarly, here you can see that there is ectropion. Ectropion is an outward displacement of the eyelid and whenever there is ectropion, also the punctum will move forward and this is also a case of punctal displacement. So basically what happens is that whenever you have either a problem in the location of the punctum, either because of displacement uh, due to ectropion or a large carinkle, or there is a problem in the patency of the punctum, either because of a foreign body like lash or because of punctal stenosis, what happens is that all the tear which is being produced by the lacrimal gland will be actually secreted into the conjunctival fornix and comes towards the conjunctiva finally to, to drain into the punctum. But if the punctum is not uh, anatomically normal, what happens is that there will be an excessive outflow of the tears which is known as watering, right? So the patient will actually complain about watering. So moving on, the next structure that we are going to talk about is the canaliculus. The canaliculus actually correspond to the superior and inferior punctum. So we have the superior and inferior canaliculi. The canaliculi basically connect the punctum to the lacrimal sac. The canaliculus basically are divided again into two parts. We have a vertical part of the canaliculus which is about 2 millimeters in length and we have a horizontal part which is about 8 millimeters. So the total length of the canaliculus is about 10 millimeters and the thickness is about 0 0.5 millimeters. So that's one important measurement that you must remember. The two parts, that is the vertical part and the horizontal part, are actually meeting at a junction which is slightly dilated and this junction is called the ampulla of the canaliculus. Now let us talk about an important rule which is called 90% 10% rule. In more than 90% of the people what happens is that the superior canaliculus and the inferior canaliculus reunite together to form one single common canaliculus and that will open into the lacrimal sac. Now instead of directly opening into the lacrimal sac, it actually opens into a small outpouching of the lacrimal sac or the diverticulum which is called the lacrimal sac of the mares. Now, this lacrimal sac of Mayer is actually, or the opening of the canaliculus, we can say it is situated at about 2.5 millimeters below the apex of the lacrimal sac. Now, what is this 10% rule? So, 10% rule says that in about 10% of the population, what happens is that each canaliculus will open separately into the sac. So, instead of uniting together into common canaliculus, they will be opening right away into the lacrimal sac. Now again, there are some important angles that we must remember. So what happens is first is the angle between the canaliculus and the common canaliculus, which is represented by the number one over here. So this angle is normally 57 degrees to 65 degrees. The second angle, we have the angle between the common canaliculus and the lacrimal sac per se, and that is about 58 to 90 degrees. Now, what is the importance of these angles? So, especially the common canaliculus to lacrimal sac angle, if it is increased, what happens is that you can see this almost straightening of the uh, pathway. So, what happens, you can have easy entry of the infections into the sac and then into the canaliculus and finally reaching the eyeball. And therefore, the, such patients who have a greater or, you know, more than 90 degrees angle between the common canaliculus and the lacrimal sac, they are at increased risk or they are increased susceptible to dacrocystitis. Next, actually, we have a wall, which is called the wall of Rosenmuller. So basically, we have a very small flap of mucosa that overhangs the junction where the common canaliculus opens into the lacrimal sac, right? So you can see this is the common canaliculus, which is opening into the lacrimal sac. And over here, you will have a 
a flap of mucosa which is called the valve of Rosenmuller. Now this basically ensures a unidirection flow of tears from the canaliculus into the lacrimal sac and prevents the reflux of tears back into the canaliculus. Coming to the histology of these canaliculi. So the canaliculi basically have an epithelium. The epithelium is stratified squamous epithelium more than 10 layers of cell and then it is surrounded by an elastic tissue which is called corium. Apart from that, the elastic tissue is again surrounded by the fibers of the orbicularis muscle. Now another important clinical point over here is that if you would remember I told you that the diameter of canaliculus is about 0.5 millimeters. However, in cases of probing we actually put these punctal dilators, we put probes which are also about 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter. So this happens because of the presence of the elastic tissue in the walls of the canaliculi. So because of the presence of the scorium, the thickness of about 0.5 millimeter of canaliculus can actually be dilated up to 2 to 3 mm. Now there is one very important relation to canaliculus that we must all understand. So here just observe okay I will be talking about this in detail in the next section that is the posterior lacrimal crest. So basically you have a specialized place dedicated to the location of the lacrimal sac which is called the lacrimal fossa where your lacrimal sac basically sits okay so don't get confused between the fossa for the lacrimal gland which is located at the superior temporal aspect of the orbit whereas over here in the medial wall of the orbit we have a separate fossa for the lacrimal sac okay so we have two crests on that lacrimal sac fossa so we have an anterior elevation of the uh, bone and we have a posterior elevation of the bone connected to that posterior elevation of the bone which is called the posterior lacrimal crest we have the posterior crust of the medial canthal tendon or in much simpler words we have a posterior part of the medial canthal tendon now what happens is that your sac and your canaliculus they nicely sit on top of that posterior part of the medial canthal tendon. Then the anterior part of the medial canthal tendon actually comes above your canaliculus and the sac nicely enveloping it and gets inserted at that anterior ridge of the bone which is called the anterior lacrimal crest. So that is one very important relation that you must understand of the canaliculus and the sac with the medial canthal tendon. So this is what I was actually talking about. So you have this pink puncta and the pink canalicula and you can see this whitish color or grayish color structure is nothing but your arms or the crosses of the medial canthal tendon. So just observe how closely related the canalicula are to your medial canthal tendon. Now, in my video on the eyelid anatomy, I mentioned and I explained in detail about the parts of orbicularis. So, we have parts of orbicularis which are present in front of the tarsal which plate which is called the upper pretarsal or the lower pretarsal orbicularis. And then we have parts of the orbicularis which are present in front of the septum which are called the preceptal orbicularis. Now, all these orbicularis parts also, they lie in very close association to your puncta. And as I mentioned that, a part of orbicularis actually encircles your corium, right? So the histology of canaliculus, we talked about that we have the epithelium and then we have the elastic tissue which is called the corium and finally we have the orbicularis fibers which are actually enveloping that elastic tissue. So that part of the orbicularis which is nicely covering the canaliculus is actually called the pars lacrimalis, right? So this picture over here actually is, uh, is depicting the same thing that we have the canalicula in close association with the fibers of so moving on to the next part of the tear transport, we will talk about the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac is about 10 to 12 millimeters long and there are different parts of the lacrimal sac as well. So we have the fundus of the lacrimal sac, which is nothing but basically what happens over here is that the common canaliculus at its entry into the lacrimal sac divides the lacrimal sac into two parts. We have an upper part which is called the fundus which is about 3 to 5 millimeters. We have a middle part which is the body about 10 to 12 millimeters and we finally have a very narrow part or uh, the part where the lacrimal sac actually becomes the nasolacrimal duct.
right that's called the neck now if you want to remember them you should remember that the body is about 10 and if you actually half it what you get is the fundus about five millimeters so again the location of the lacrimal sac is also very very important so in my video on anatomy of the orbit i told you which uh, bones will actually form the medial wall of the orbit so if you want to understand the location of the lacrimal sac you should understand the various parts of the medial wall of the orbit okay so the medial wall of the orbit is actually formed by the maxillary bone and to be more specific it is the frontal process of the maxillary bone then we have the lacrimal bone the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone now if you carefully observe there's a depression present in the medial wall and that depression is actually consisting of slight part of the, the frontal process of the maxillary bone and some amount of the lacrimal bone. And then you have these two ridges which are present. The anterior ridge or the ridge which is present ahead is called the anterior lacrimal crest. The posterior ridge is a posterior lacrimal crest. And the fossa which is present between the anterior and the posterior lacrimal crest is called your lacrimal fossa. Okay, and this is where your lacrimal sac will nicely sit. The lacrimal fossa is basically formed by the frontal process of the maxillary bone and the lacrimal bone. Now, here in the first picture, which is the coronal section, you can see that this green color, the green color actually represents your lacrimal sac. And just observe that the lacrimal sac is situated in the medial part of the orbit and it is present in close association to your ethmoidal air cells which is represented in blue color here and the various conchi of the nose. So we had this is the superior concha, the middle concha and then finally we have the inferior concha. Now what happens in dacrocystorhinostomy is that, so normally, first let me tell you what happens is, the tears will come from the lacrimal gland, flow to the conjunctiva, finally into the punctum, canaliculus and the lacrimal sac. And then finally it comes out into the nose through the nasolacrimal duct. Now, if there's obstruction in the nasolacrimal duct, what happens is that the tears will actually flow back into the eye leading to watering. So to prevent this in dacrocystorhinostomy, what we do is we create an, an anastomosis between the lacrimal sac and between the nasal mucosa, thereby bypassing this nasolacrimal duct pathway. So what we do here is we create a new opening in the tear sac or in the lacrimal sac. We punch out a hole in the medial aspect of the uh, orbit wall. That means we take out the lacrimal part of the lacrimal bone and part of the frontal process of the maxillary bone. And therefore, the tears can now straight away flow into the nose without having to go through that pathway of the nasal lacrimal duct. Now, this creation of anastomosis is called dacrocystorhinostomy surgery. Another important clinical point that you must remember is with regard to the frontoethmoidal suture. The same thing I also mentioned when I was talking about uh, the anatomy of orbit. So the suture is present between the ethmoid bone and between the uh, frontal bone, right? So when you are carrying out your DCR, when you are chipping out that extra bone, make sure you don't cross the suture because if you cross the suture, you might actually be exposing the dura of the cranial, uh, cranial cavity. So that is one important point. To remember. Now let us talk about the relations of the lacrimal sac. The nicely sitting blue color structure over here is the lacrimal sac and you can see it is covered anteriorly by the medial palpebral ligament or the medial canthal ligament. Now remember this, the relationships of the canaliculus where I mentioned how the anterior and the posterior part of the medial palpebral ligament nicely covers your sac and the canaliculus, right? So going on the same lines basically what happens is that this medial palpebral ligament actually covers the upper part of your lacrimal sac. So whenever there's distension of the sac, the upper part will definitely be covered nicely with medial palpebral ligament. So it has a support of the medial canthal ligament and therefore the sac distension will always occur in the lower part of the sac where uh, which is mechanically weaker because it is just covered by the orbicularis and the skin and not by the medial canthal ligament. Okay. Now another clinical point is that Going on the similar lines, because the lower part of the sac is mechanically weaker, it is also susceptible to develop lacrimal abscesses and fistula. So all the fistulas, uh, which happens because of an abs abscess and sometimes congenital fistula as well, they'll also open up in the lower part owing to the weakness in this area. So what are the posterior relations of the lacrimal sac? 
So what is the elevation of the bone which is present posteriorly? So that is the posterior lacrimal crest. So the posterior lacrimal crest and anything which is attached to the posterior lacrimal crest will form the posterior relations of the lacrimal sac. Laterally, if you see, it is actually covered by the skin, orbicularis, muscle and the related fascia. Medially, as I already told you, medially is your nose. So the ethmoidal air sinuses which is present here. So this is your lacrimal sac. Then the orbital plate, that is the medial part of the orbit. So this is the ethmoidal air sinuses, the superior concha, the middle concha and the inferior concha. So the lacrimal sac medially is located, medially it is related to the ethmoidal air sinuses and the middle meatus. Now one very important relation to the lacrimal sac that we must all understand is that of the angular vein. Okay, so this angular vein, as you can see it drawn in blue color, it actually crosses the medial palpable ligament about 8 millimeters medial to the medial canthus. Okay, so it crosses about 8 millimeters from the medial canthus. So let me explain it to you properly. So suppose this is the eye and this is the medial canthus. So the angular vein actually is situated at a distance of about 8 millimeters medial to the medial canthus, right? Now, sometimes what happens at, is that in between, you might also have some tributary which might actually pass. So many a times, a tributary of the angular vein will also pass between the angular vein and the medial canthus, right? So definitely, if you were actually to make a surgical incision at 8 millimeters, you will definitely damage your angular vein and even somewhere in between. So what is a safe surgical incision in case of sac surgery okay so to avoid profuse bleeding during the sac surgery it is always advisable that you take incision and that incision should not be made more than three millimeters medial to the medial canthus so this is your safe zone if you were to go more medially there are more chances that either you will cut the anglo vein or some tributary of the anglo vein which lies in that area so that is one important clinical point Next, let us deep dive into the nasolacrimal duct. So, we are coming into the nose now. The nasolacrimal duct is actually the inferior continuation of your lacrimal sac. So, it's finally going to open into this uh, meatus which is formed by the inferior concha and that is called the inferior nasal meatus. So, don't get confused. Whenever you ask nasolacrimal duct opens into which meatus, it is the inferior meatus okay now many a times uh, students are asked about the direction of the nasal lacrimal duct so you can remember the direction of nasal lacrimal duct as downwards obviously it has to come down and it is slightly backwards and laterally okay so the nose so you, you have the center of the face or so center of the nose and the direction is slightly laterally so you can remember dbl that is downwards backwards and laterally coming to the length it is about 18 millimeters in length and the diameter is about three millimeters so now let us talk about the parts of nasolacrimal duct so we have two parts basically we have the introscious and the intramiatal part so we know that it is actually opening into the inferior meatus which is basically formed by the inferior turbinate okay so on the lateral aspect what do you have you have the maxillary bone right and medially you have this concha so up till the point where you have your, uh, what do you say, the maxillary bone, the point between that maxillary bone and the inferior concha that will form your introscious part and that is about 12.5 millimeters in the length. However, below that you have the intramiatal part where it has actually entered that inferior meatus where it lies in the basically in the mucous membrane of the lateral wall of the nose so that part of the nld is called the intramiatal part which is about 5.5 if you add these both up you will get about 18 millimeters that is the length of the nasolacrimal duct now if you compare this if you uh, compare it to the anterior nares so if this is the nose okay the situation of the nasolacrimal duct is about 30 to 40 millimeters from your anterior nares so this uh, slide actually summarizes all the important measurements. So the canaliculi, basically we have a vertical part of about 2 millimeters, horizontal 8 millimeters. So total comes to about 10 millimeters. Now, if you remember that 10 millimeters, just remember that the body of the, uh, the lacrimal sac is also about 10 millimeters and the fundus is about half of that, that is 3 to 5 millimeters. After that, 
you remember again that the total length the nasal lacrimal duct is 18 okay and the intraosseous is 12.5 and the intramiatal is 5.5 millimeters important clinical nugget related to the nasal lacrimal duct is that the size or you can say the width of the nasal lacrimal duct is much more smaller in females compared to males and that is the reason why it gets blocked easier easily in females compared to males and therefore females are more predisposed to nasal lacrimal duct obstruction and subsequent dacrocystitis. The opening of this duct into the inferior meatus is again guarded by another wall and that wall is called the wall of Hasner. Right now, there are a lot of walls which are actually present in your lacrimal apparatus, okay. But the two important ones which have actually stood the test of times are the wall of Rosenmuller and the wall of Hasner. The wall of Rosenmuller was situated at the junction of the common canalicus with the lacrimal sac, whereas the wall of Hasner is located at the opening of the nasal lacrimal duct into the inferior meatus. Now, this valve of Hasna actually prevents the entry of air into the lacrimal sac when the air is actually blown out of a closed nose. So, whenever this uh, valve of Hasna is not functioning, patient will actually have this escape of air into the eye through the NLD. Now, canal canalization of this nasal lacrimal duct actually occurs quite late in the fetus. In about 30% of the infants, what happens is that this canalization is actually delayed and such patients will actually come with epiphora and this condition is called congenital nasal lacrimal duct. Now, I'm going to end this video uh, leaving you with this so many walls which are actually given in the literature. Okay, what is important for us is that we have basically the, uh, the valve of Rosenmuller and the valve of Hasner. With this, we reach the end of the video and this is actually an MCQ question for you to practice your knowledge about what you just uh, read and understood. So, tell me the answer in the comment section. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you and have a nice day.